Hi folks, Astronomy Live here. Tonight I had hoped to do another live webcast of Comet Atlas. Unfortunately though, the weather did not cooperate, so I'm going to have to put that off until the weather clears up. But instead I'd like to take some time tonight to show and demonstrate some software I've now developed for processing and handling and analyzing the images of the comet automatically. Now I know these types of videos don't get as much interest because of course most people watching don't necessarily have their own telescope and deep space camera that could make use of this software. But even if you fall in that category, please stick around because you might find the analysis interesting. So what I've got here is an image, a raw image, from my latest Atlas webcast loaded up in SAO Image DS9. And as you can see it doesn't look like much. It's just black with a few little dots on it, just the brightest stars are visible, you can't even see the comet at all. That's because my deep space camera takes images in a high bit depth format, the FITS file format is what it uses, and most programs can't even open that natively, and even when they do, if they display the histogram in a linear fashion like this, you only see just the very brightest things, and the rest of it is just hidden at the bottom of the histogram. So you need a way of translating these images down to 8 bits to be converted into formats that are more commonly handled by other programs like JPEG files, bitmap files, that kind of thing. But I needed a way of doing this in an automated fashion because until recently I've had to do a lot of manual processing to make time-lapse images, manually saving each individual frame after processing it in a program like PixInsight. So, even though PixInsight can do some batch operations, it still led to a certain amount of manual tweaking and saving to get the final time-lapse video. And that's not very convenient, so I've developed some software for handling that automatically. The other, the other problem it solves is what you're seeing right here, where you don't see the most interesting part of the histogram where the comet is hiding. You can reveal that in this program by switching to a logarithmic function and viewing the brightness in a logarithmic way. Now suddenly we can see the comet. It's not perfect, but it's better. So how do we do this automatically? Well, I've developed a program for automatically tone mapping these images. So I've called this fitstonemapper.py, and what it does is it searches for files in the directory with a certain pattern. Right now I've got this set to .new, but I'll upload this to GitHub and set it uh, to look for a default file pattern of .fit star, so fit or fits files. I've got it set to .new here because these images are, are, are already astrometrically solved and that process changes their extension. So they are actually just fits files with a different extension. Then it opens them up and does a tone map uh, transformation on them using the Reinhardt algorithm. So this is a pretty typical tone mapping algorithm you might find in other software for making HDR images, basically turning high bit depth files into uh, 8 bit images that can be displayed on a normal monitor and reveal a wider portion of dynamic range than you would normally see. So once this program is set up and loaded into the directory, where the files are located, all you have to do is execute the Python script and it will begin processing the images one by one. So now you can see the comet moving and it's saving these as JPEGs and it will also save the complete sequence as an MP4 file if you just want to upload a time-lapse uh, completely raw. So now I'll show you some time-lapse videos that I've made over the last several webcasts using this software. So that was pretty cool, and it definitely streamlines my process for making time-lapse videos out of individual raw FITS files, and allows me to make a lot more time-lapse videos of this comet as I take more images of it than I would normally be able to do with the amount of time I have. The other thing I want to improve on is the amount of time it takes me to do astrometry and calculate the orbits of various objects, including Comet Atlas. 
So before, one way I might do this is opening up these images in SAO image DS9 and then carefully clicking right where the object is in the image to get a region whose coordinates I can get information about. So this will give me the actual right ascension and declination coordinates of the comet and then I would have to go and create a new file that is basically a text file formatting these observations to be loaded into a program like FindOrb in order to calculate the orbit. Now there are software packages out there that help streamline this process like Astrometrica that help you automatically format those files and take a lot of the work out of it. However, it's still a process that involves a fair bit of time going through image after image. I really wanted something that was just very quick, very simple, even if it meant sacrificing a little bit of accuracy by automating part of the process. So that's what I've developed with my astrometry program. So I've got this file here and basically with this I can open up these astrometrically solved files that have this extension automatically changed into the .new ex extension. Uh, astrometry.net's software does that automatically so that's why I've got it set up this way and it will allow me to create an output file that contains these observations already formatted the way they need to be to be loaded into FindOrb to calculate the orbit and all I have to do is click on the individual images in order to do the astrometry so here's the program and all I have to do is click anywhere near the nucleus and it will automatically find the brightest pixel and then format that into an observation and then I go image to image solving all of the images that way getting the coordinates of the comet and then loading that into find orb to solve for the orbit pretty quick and easy process much faster than I would be able to do if I were doing this by hand with SAO image DS9 or honestly even if I were getting some assistance with Astrometrica the process is much faster this way although with Astrometrica I could definitely tweak it more and get more accurate results by finding just the brightest pixel you get a little bit of uncertainty there because the comet is a diffuse object it's not like an asteroid that has a very bright center where it's a star-like object it's a diffuse object and so there's going to be a little bit of wiggle there in terms of the exact pixel that ends up being the brightest so the solution comes out uh, not quite as accurate as you could do if you were doing it by hand but still accurate enough to be able to get a valid orbit solution uh, and be able to actually see where the comet is going. So here's my orbit solution from the astrometry that I did. So I have a mean residual of 1.77 arc seconds. That's decent. It's not great and um, good enough for our purposes though. I also am using an observation point that isn't quite accurate. This is a an observatory in Fort Myers. This is obviously not where I was and obviously this is not the observer who did the observation. The observer in this case is me, but I'm just borrowing their observatory code because it's close enough to approximate uh, the results without doxing myself here. So here are the orbital elements and now we can load these orbital elements into other programs to visualize the orbit. So now I'm going to load up Celestia and show you what the orbit actually looks like. Alright, so here we are with the comet's orbit loaded into Celestia. You can see Comet Atlas up here and you can see the red line denoting its orbit. Now, as you can see, the comet is not being rendered directly on its orbit. In fact, the orbit is being rendered a little bit incorrectly over this portion here. This is common with Celestia. With highly elliptical orbits that are close to parabolic, it tends to draw the orbit lines a little bit wrong. You can see it just sort of turns into a straight line over a portion of the orbit there. But ignoring that, you can see that the red line matches up very well with this yellow line which is the orbit of the Great Comet of 1844. So astronomers believe that Comet Atlas is related to that comet from 1844, a comet that was also discovered in the latter half of December 1844, just as Comet Atlas was discovered in the latter half of December 2019. Now, at that time, uh, in 1844, the comet of uh, 1844 had an orbit that was very similar to Comet Atlas with an inclination of about 45 degrees, uh, an argument of perihelion, and a longitude of ascending node that were all very similar to Comet Atlas. However, the comet experienced a fair degree of perturbation from 
the planets on its way out of the out of the inner solar system and if you were to look at its orbital elements today with an epoch of uh, now you would see that the inclination has increased by about five degrees now if you just go onto JPL's page for the Great Comet of 1844 they're going to show you the orbital elements as they existed back then back in 1844, 1845, around the time it was being observed. But if you go onto the, the, the JPL Horizon system and you uh, request orbital elements for the comet as they exist today, after the perturbations on its way out of the inner solar system, you'll find the inclination has changed by about 5 degrees, increased. And I confirm this uh, as well with Atlas by calculating what would happen to its orbit over the next couple of hundred years both with my own observations and find orb and with JPL and they showed that Comet Atlas will also experience an increase in inclination of a couple of degrees but doesn't seem to be predicting as much as Comet 18 uh, the Great Comet of 1844 experienced so it personally makes me wonder if perhaps these comets are not only related but were at one time a single object fairly recently in their astronomical uh, lifespans. So that's rather interesting. Uh, and it does give us hope that perhaps Comet Atlas will put on a great show as its brother did in 1844. But only time will tell. It's still possible that it could fizzle out. Uh, the observations I've seen uh, come in over the last couple of days on its brightness. It seems to be slightly underperforming some of the models. So we'll see. Only time will tell. But there is hope that it will put on a very nice show. But in case it doesn't, I'm going to try to continue to observe it as much as possible to get images of it while it's still around, just in case it doesn't survive perihelion, because it is going to get within uh, a quarter of an astronomical unit from the sun, just as the comet of 1844 did. So if I fast forward time here, we can also take a look at what happens with the tail of the comet, because I get this question quite often, is the tail going to brush Earth? Uh, this question comes up and oftentimes I feel uh, that the question is really being motivated by an irrational fear of comets. Uh, over well, about a hundred years ago, Halley's Comet passed by Earth and was positioned roughly between the Earth and the Sun with the tail pointing on our direction. And some fear mongers ginned up fear about that then as well and sold comet pills to try to protect people from the toxic gases of the comet. But in reality, though the gases that are in the coma and the tail would generally be toxic to humans, they're very tenuous and would not noticeably affect our atmosphere, even if it did brush our planet. However, as you can see, the tail points away from the sun, and it does not point at our planet because it does not come between Earth and the sun at any point. However, at the time of perihelion, at the end of May, you'll notice that the tail actually is pointed roughly at one of the inner solar system planets. Mars gets potentially a blast from the comet's tail. Now, really, I don't know if the comet's tail is going to grow to such a length that it could reach all the way into Mars's orbit, but even if it did, it's not going to turn into a Hollywood movie with a planet devastated by huge falling rocks all over the place. That's just not going to happen. The tail is composed of dust that is being pushed around by solar radiation pressure and solar wind, uh, very light particles, not something that's going to devastate or noticeably affect a planet like Mars. However, I will attempt to observe Mars that day and uh, see what happens, see if we can see anything going on with the planet. Personally, I'm not expecting to see anything going on with the planet, uh, but hopefully what we will see is a nice bright comet around that time uh, as it brightens up and approaches the sun. So after that, the comet moves past the sun very quickly and then proceeds off below the plane of the ecliptic and leaves us. So I'll, I will continue to observe the comet and uh, do some live webcasts whenever the weather does allow and uh, post time-lapse videos afterwards using this software that I've created. You can find the software in the video description and uh, go check it out, and I hope you find it useful. Until next time, thanks for watching, and clear skies.